is a native of Glendive, Montana. Um, <laughs> she, yes, um, according to my bio that I have here, uh, Lorna writes from Helena, Montana, where she lives on a small farm with her husband and a soccer playing foul herding sheepdog named Little Bear. <laughs> Milne has published essays and short stories in periodicals such as The Frontiers, a journal of women's studies, the Boston Globe magazine, the Gettysburg Review, Walking, Orion, Highlights for Children, and The Sun. She is a University of Montana journalism graduate who teaches writing and literature at Carroll College. Milne grew up in eastern Montana, Glendive, near the Cameron's homesteads. Thank you for joining us this morning, Lorna. Well, thanks so much for coming. Um, I'm getting over a cold, so I'm not my, I don't have my usual voice. I'm sorry for, about that. Well, I've spent a lot of time here. I did most of my research in the early days upstairs in that wonderful room. I know we need a new building. I know I need, we need a new building, but this is, it's a wonderful place to work. I want to th thank Kirby Lambert for inviting me to speak today. And my understanding was this is mostly a group of Montana Historical Society volunteers, so I've designed my presentation with you in mind. I usually don't go into this much detail when talking to the public at large, and if I see you starting to nod off, I'll switch <laughs> gears. <laughs> what I have in mind is a bit about research and biography. Oh, and I'm going to start these slides. These do not coincide with my talk. They're just the slides that the Historical Society has scanned. So and this was going to be the cover, um, but it wasn't sharp enough. But I love this image of Evelyn and the bear cub and the um, rifle case there and the horse. Yeah. But they found another nice horse picture for the cover. So the slides will scroll through. Um, anyway, I don't usually go into this much detail, but I'm going to try it out on you. What I have in mind is a bit about research and biography, which I'll illustrate with the most interesting discovery, my search for e Evelyn and Ewan's wedding date, or lack thereof. After this initial description, I'll talk about some site visits in eastern Montana and our visit to England and Scotland in 2010. This is mostly low-tech, as I have some photo albums to pass around, and I thought it was fine because Evelyn had photo albums. However, I do have a PowerPoint presentation on our, on our visit to the second Cameron home site, the one I devoted a chapter to, Ramblings in the Badlands. And then I'll read a few pages from my biography um, and open it up for questions. Does that sound good? Okay. But first, a story about a masquerade. I thought it was so close to Halloween. My husband's always saying, tell that story about Ewan's disguise. To begin, in journalism school in the late 70s, at least at the University of Montana, we were taught to confirm suspect details with three sources. When it came time to write about the Cameron's wedding date, I couldn't come up with even one source. Uh, but let me back up and lay out my suspicions, because it is a dramatic story. Some of the earliest research I did was reading Ewan's published and unpublished articles. These articles helped me figure out their location in eastern Montana and get an early sense of their shared interest, hunting. Since I'm from Glendive and my family ran a John Deere implement business for 78 years and I hunted with my father and brothers, I could begin to imagine what the Camerons were up to, which is in integral to writing biography, I've learned. From from the Puma, or mountain lion article, I realized the Camerons were hunting in the Cabin Creek area south of the Yellowstone River by early November. Later on, when Yoon was dying in California in 1915, Evelyn made reference to a concussion Yoon had received when thrown from a horse in mid-September of 1889 in Illinois. 
She said he was ill for a week. So they arrive in New York in early September, start west, are laid up in Illinois for a while, outfitted in Miles City, and hunting mountain lions on Cabin Creek in the Powder River country by November 1st. That would have made photographing Montana, Donna Lucy's estimate of the Camerons marrying quietly in the fall of 1889, um, pretty unlikely. So I had my suspicions early, but I had a lot of work ahead of me. Therefore, I made a note and plowed ahead. And I should say that all along, I'd been checking the genealogy records at the Montana Historical Society. The British have kept thorough records. I was finding Evelyn's sibling wedding dates, but not hers. I asked Brian Chovers at MHS if he'd help by contacting Donna Lucy and asking her where she found the date. He did, and she wrote back that her research was packed into boxes because they were moving. Now to the piece that sparks John's imagination. Forward to years later, and one benefit in taking so long to finish this book is more material surfaced. When I was searching ship manifests for specific dates on the Cameron's travel back to England in 1900, Ewan was ill and they went back to England, then back to Montana again in 1901. I had Evelyn's diaries to lay out their dates of travel, but I wanted confirmation. That's why I was searching manifests. Searching all dates, I came across Evelyn's name in September of 1889. This is the year of the hunting trip. And surprise, she is listed as traveling with a Madame Valda, Ewan's first wife. I searched and searched for a reference to Ewan on manifest around this time, at first innocently assuming they'd agreed to meet in New York City and had traveled separately. Ewan Cameron wasn't listed on any manifest, which is not to say his name still won't surface, as manifests are incomplete. To hedge my bets, I put in a research request at MHS, knowing the archivists would be more familiar with manifests. Alas, they too only found the reference to Evelyn in 1889, nothing on Ewan. About this time, I spent a wonderful afternoon in Terry with Winona Breen, the woman who orchestrated the transcribing of Evelyn's diaries. Nona and I had been carrying on an email correspondence for years, but this was our first visit in person, and we had a lot to talk about. As usually happens, we got to the good stuff late. We had to drive back to Helena. When we were running out of time, Nona asked if I had found a wedding date. I said no, and told her something of my efforts. She had long been suspect as well, and had recently been corresponding with another researcher who al also questioned Evelyn's voyage with Madame Valda. Winona and I agreed that it appeared the Camerons had traveled on the same ship in early September, unmarried, with you imposing as Madame Valda. <laughs> yeah. Nona put me in touch with the other researcher as well. Now by that time, I knew a little about Madame Valda. She was Boston-born Julia Wheelock, who was now an opera singer, and, was and I was looking for a divorce decree. Soon after my visit with Nona, I found Ewan and Julia's divorce date. Then Bradley Hansen, a research librarian at Carroll College, located the decree for me. Julia and Ewan were divorced October 17th, 1889, well after Evelyn and Ewan had arrived in the United States. So back to the ship, the Teutonic. As I said, Nona and I were pretty sure by now that Madame Valda was Ewan. Remember, no t TSA pre-checks in those days. <laughs> what we don't know was did Ewan wear a disguise or pose as a valet, and who thought of this plan? I have a hunch it was Evelyn. She had the imagination. Even so, I kept looking, knowing that I'd have to say something about their marriage or non-marriage. I had plenty to work on, so this issue simmered as I wrote other chapters. 
in one of the archivists, I think Becca Cole, told me about the new article coming out in the summer of 2014 in Montana, the magazine of Western history, about the Camerons. And the authors confirmed the Camerons were never formally married, so there's my third confirmation. All said, I may still be looking for a later wedding date if Ann Roberts and Christine Wordsworth hadn't given me the cultural context of the Camerons' unorthodox union in their article, Divas, Divorce, and Disclosure. Now I'd like to talk about some site visits, which is easily the funnest, my favorite part of research. As you can imagine the reading the diaries, and by the way, reading the diaries became a lot easier as time went on because they were all scanned. And Winona um, had the transcriptions complete, and she would send them to me as they got another year complete, so I had those to work with. Um, so my later work wasn't so much here except to confirm things. I was at Carroll College on a big screen enlarging the diaries because they were so tiny, which probably saved my eyes, and Donna Lucy didn't have that luxury. This book couldn't have been written without um, Lucy's uh, early work. Anyway, I'd like to talk about the site visits. So soon after seeing an exhibit of Evelyn Cameron's photographs at the Montana Historical Society, I toured the Cameron Museum in Terry while visiting family. I'd just gotten back to Montana when Lucy's book was coming out. The citizen researchers of Terry have material the MHS doesn't. An intimate knowledge of the area and people who knew the Camerons, which can't be replicated. About five years later, in 1997, we visited the third Eve Ranch. Over time, the Camerons owned or rented four different ranches. And this is my first photo album. Here, let me pass that around. Someday these will be PowerPoints, but I'm not there yet. Um, my father and daughters are in the photographs around the cabin. We asked Dad if he could take us to the cabin because my oldest daughter was doing a Montana history project on Evelyn. Again, this is 1997. Evelyn and Ewan lived here from 1907 until Evelyn died in 1928. Evelyn had two gardens here, a kitchen garden and a truck garden, and this farm is near the town of Marsh, where Evelyn could catch a local train to Glendiver Terry. And I hope to visit this ranch again this year. I've heard the cabin has collapsed, but Bill Bloom, the farmer, is still alive and quite knowledgeable about the Camerons. We did visit with him in 97 a little. I knew when Ryan chose Evelyn for her subject, and she did this on her own after hearing about Evelyn, that young people would find Evelyn interesting. Ryan summarized, Evelyn Cameron was a hardworking woman and a great photographer. She was a very kind person. Studying her made me want to be just like her. Now, I'm going to switch gears here, and I think I do need help. I have a PowerPoint for these next, um, this next visit. The second Eve Ranch is now on BLM land near Dennis's. I'm just going to call him Dennis's farm. It was really interesting. So this was 2014. Yes, I need the second um, set of slides. Or the second PowerPoint, please. People were frustrated pretty quickly with requests to visit these ranches. Um, so 1990, Lucy's book came out. This was 2014, so 24 years later. I guess a lot of time had passed. And uh, thank you. Okay, I've got to start it. Thanks so much. Um, these are slides of the second ranch site, and I devote a chapter in the book to this site. It's called Ramblings in the ba Badlands. So I really wanted to go there. Evelyn had great records on building the place. Um, it's the only place they built on their own. Otherwise, they bought um, available ranches. And it was on the north side of the Yellowstone, which for years and years, I was thinking, oh, way up 
in the North Terry Badlands. Well, it wasn't. It was, it's literally, you drive over the Felon Bridge if you're heading out to eastern Montana, and you look north, and you can see Dennis's um, irrigation pipes, and right beyond there are some hills, and Evelyn's home site was in there. So they were really close to the river, but it was beautiful. Okay, let's see if this works. And this is, these are slides I took on that visit. And we're in a lot of pictures because I used us as locators because it was a really hard site to find and I wanted to be able to find it again. Anyway, so I'm only going to refer to Dennis as Dennis. And here's some photos. This second, second set of photos were taken, as I said, in June of tw 2014. And it's um, from the chapter of building their second cabin, the only one they built themselves and the six years then that they lived in the Badlands north of the river. Of course, there were no bridges, so to get to Terry, they either had to cross the ice or take um, the ferry. The Camerons took a long time deliberating where to put the cabin. Old timers had warned them about the ice cakes, and from my childhood, I can remember the ice cakes. With climate change, there's not much in the way of ice cakes anymore, but they were awesome when we were young. The ice cakes that piled up on the shore dream breakup of the Yellowstone River. Evelyn was much more practical than Ewan, and she finally chose the site based on the placement of springs and distance from the river. At one point, she advised the builders against placing the house on a weak foundation. They listened to her and used this hillside instead. So we're heading up to the hillside. That's my dad and my husband. and. Um, well, nobody knew exactly where it was. Dennis and his wife didn't. But we found a post and we found logs on the ground and by the description I could tell where it was. Evelyn's descriptions. And this stake is the only thing remaining upright, the first stake you saw. Although there are old hand-hewn logs on the ground. And again, this place was hard to locate. I had a map you and used in an article and the name of a farmer from one of my contacts in Terry. I called that initial farmer from my parents' living room right after we had celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. The farmer was so resistant to us coming that I finally handed the phone over to my father, and remember he'd been talking to farmers for 60 years as an implement dealer, and he talked him into it. The skill dad used to navigate that conversation was impressive. Then we went to my brother's house, and he found the GPS point, which we discovered was much closer to a more friendly farmer, one of Ty's good customers. So Ty called him, and Dennis gave us permission to go across his land to access the BLM land. Dad, John, and I drove to the country, bothering the farmer on a Sunday afternoon when he was having coffee with neighbors. Dennis gave us some directions, and we started out pretty much on a cow path. When we made a wrong turn, Dennis and his wife zoomed up on their John Deere mule and led us to the area. They didn't know where the cabin was exactly, so John, Dad, and I poked around, and I found the site based on Evelyn's good description of it. It was an incredibly, oh, these aren't going, are they? Oh, huh. It was an incredibly, you can see the cow path and our um, pickup tracks. It was an incredibly wet spring. You can see how tall the grass is, and this is June, and there's the house site right there, up ag tucked against that hill, where the, it's sort of a shadow. There was purple wild echinacea and the prickly pear. That's the only post stand left standing. And I'm standing in the hollow that was there. Um, their, the base of their cabin, the floor of their cabin. And you can see the hillside she wanted them to put the foundation against. And there's one of the hand-hewn logs. Um, I wanted to get to the purple echinacea. And there it is from a um, further distance. We found the um, springs, and I also found the site that I think was the barn. She built the barn further down the river, or down the hillside. 
there's the echinacea. Um, Evelyn was always killing snakes up here, so the men were leading, as you noticed in the pictures. <laughs> Evelyn sa summarized for her mother their land-seeking efforts. We have been just one year negotiating for two and a quarter sections of railroad land, 1,400 acres. This fall, we were able to conclude the purchase for $1 an acre, and I'm extremely glad because it is a beautiful spot facing due south and abundance of feed, shelter, water, and wood. The river is our southern boundary and will supply us with plenty of good fish. And it was a beautiful sight. You could see down to the Yellowstone. I haven't yet visited their first home site, which is close to Terry. Now, the last site I'll tell you about is in Scotland and London. But first, I'll get through the rest of these slides. There's the prickly pear in bloom. And that's from, you, she found all kinds of agates up on this um, hillside. That's the long view. And this is where they got the wood. She talked about the men. She had two workmen um, cutting down the pine trees, bringing them over. She helped scrape them raw. Ewan was off hunting. So it was the Badlands. And th they hunted on this side of the river all their life. So it was nice for them to be over here. In 1900, the Camerons went back to England to determine the cause of Ewan's stomach problems. And now I'll pass around this other album. And there's a yellow marker when the trip to Scotland ends. You start at the beginning, and then you go back to the yellow marker. In 2010, 110 years later, our youngest daughter studied in Scotland, so we followed her and visited Evelyn's haunts. We also visited her family's country estate, Furs Down Park south of London. And by the way, it's now a prep school, and they have a photography lab and a building devoted to art. It was, the headmaster knew nothing about the Camerons, and I do owe him a book. I told him I'd send him one when it was done. He was really helpful and tour toured us all around the prep school. We took a train to the towns in Scotland, which included Edinburgh, Fort William, Inverness, and Dornick, and I had Evelyn's diary so I could track her. The Camerons ended up renting a house in Dornick, Scotland for the winter. Now Ewan's brother, Alan, and his family had rented a house in Fort William, and there's a picture of their house in the album, for the year. So the two families spent a lot of time together. Ewan and his brother, Alan, were close, sharing a love of the natural world and a responsibility for their mother. I was going to read at this point, but I'll, I'm going to tell you one more thing about research, and then I'll read a bit from the book. Because this, too, is part of um, writing a biography. This third pr piece of research I'd like to talk about is the most practical. Whereas I knew something about gardening, hunting, photography, and bird watching, I decided to explore Evelyn's daily life that I knew a little about, that I knew little about. So first, I married an older man. But that's where the comparison ends between John and Ewan, except John's a pretty good birding partner as well. Marrying John included a small farm where I could raise chickens, sell eggs, hatch ducklings, had enough land to grow a truck garden, or the modern version of a truck garden. We ran a CSA, which is Community Supported Agriculture, for five years with two other Helena Valley farmers, working harder than I've ever worked. Still, it didn't compare to Evelyn's 2,000 pounds of potatoes that she'd harvest each fall. Now, my siblings and I had a Shetland pony as children, which our grandpa had bought us. But other than walking to the sales yard to pick up Chico and bring him home to ride in the backyard, and a dozen or so commercial horseback rides, I knew practically nothing about horses. We have good friends in Helena who spend their days on horses, rounding up and checking on cattle, so I'd ask them whenever I had a question. And Evelyn's diaries filled me in as well. Those were the weak spots. 
commercial farming and horses. But otherwise I chose Evelyn, in part I suspect because we shared so many things. She has mentored me and I've been able to explore aspects of myself through her, which is what I think the literary experience of reading and writing gives us. And there are things left to do. I've not yet explored the Powder River country where they lived for the first two years in Montana, nor sailed on a steamship across the Atlantic, nor found their hunting camps in the Missouri breaks, all things I hope to do, except I think it'll be hard to find passage on a steamship. <laughs> and I have no interest in shooting a grizzly bear. I've had my own encounters with bears and I'm grateful to have survived them. So now I'd like to read a little bit. I haven't had a chance to read from the chapter on Scotland and since we spent so much time talking about it, I thought I would. I'm gonna skip some of the dry paragraphs. And so I won't read too long and there'll be time for questions. So they had spent, they got to um, Scotland in July, to England in July. We're hanging out in Mrs. Cameron's house. She was extravagant and they needed to move her. So they worked all fall um, getting ready to move to Dornick. And Evelyn, they went up to visit Ellen. Evelyn went on a house hunting trip because Ewan wasn't feeling well. And then they finally chose a house in Dornick, Scotland. That was a really beautiful little town to visit. Um, so this is the house. They've arrived at the house. Evelyn and Ewan decided to rent the Tignamara house in Dornick, Scotland. They spent quite a bit of time getting Mrs. Cameron's uh, affairs in order so the three of them could move to Scotland. Already, Evelyn and Ewan knew they could never combine households with Mrs. Cameron, which had been one of their options if Ewan's health continued to decline. And I'll change my voice when Evelyn talks, um, her when I quote from her diary. Talked unpleasant subject over of Mrs. Cameron's bad managing propensities and extravagance. She trades with two bakers, two green grocers, allows books to run unpaid for months, and has no means of checking them. Bills always dropping in. It makes us feel so sick and disgusted. Ewan eventually took his mother to task for her housekeeping, but it fell on Evelyn to arrange a bank advance to pay off, pay off Mrs. Cameron's debts. Although she and Ewan saw eye to eye on Mrs. Cameron, they differed on other business matters. Quote, business talk, I made Ewan irate. My views are not his. Ever since the early days of the Polo Pony disaster, Evelyn exhibited more business acumen than Ewan. Shortly before returning to Montana, Evelyn said as much. Ewan and I confab on future plans. I'm not very complimentary to him on his management of our affairs, and I insist on being allowed at least partly my way in the future. Finally, after storing Mrs. Cameron's furniture and a trip to see Wick Wickham to sec secure the bank loan, how often it must have frustrated Evelyn that she had to go to Wickham, that was her trustee, for access to her own money. They vacated Mrs. Cameron's extravagant household. A row six, awoke Nellie. I got water on to boil, made toast, folded sheets, screwed down lid box, roped it, packed Ewan's bag. Men arrived 7.50 and carted all to station, 15 things in all. Mrs. Cameron had Benny, her cat, in basket. After nights in Edinburgh and in Inverness, they arrived at their dwelling, the Tignamara. Parlor maid came out to receive us. I and Mrs. Cameron partook of a little light refreshment. Men came and put trunks, etc., in rightful rooms. Mrs. Cameron very pleased with the house. I felt rather blue. You in pains and very exhausted. Extremely nice servants, very pretty cook, Teeny Monroe cook and Beatrice Monroe table maid. No relation. The next morning, Evelyn went out to order stores and to buy meat at the butcher's. Meat very dear here, best London prices. 
Milk and butter came from Mrs. Inglis' farm, the, quote, only clean farm here. And of course, Evelyn volunteered to trudge across the fields and collect the milk and cream, and later in the month, the Christmas turkey. Dornick, a village on the sea with a famous golf course, the oldest course in Scotland, Evelyn learned, is still known for its good Scotch air and temperate climate. If Ewan was going to improve, it would be here. Ewan out without me, but by instinct, I went to the nearest sea. He was there on golf links, and we enjoyed the sea in view. Very lovely. To the sea, they ventured again on Sunday, where they saw a scalp and callop, a sea duck known for the male's loud musical note. Evelyn returned in time to attend church with Mrs. Cameron at the Dornick Cathedral. Beautiful, spacious edifice, good organ and organist, and sing up choir. She was always commenting on the music. Um, she had a good ear, and she was well trained. That afternoon, all three of them walked, Ewan and Evelyn farther onto the sand dunes, taking shelter under some bunkers. The Dornick Cathedral and butcher shop still exist as well as a Carnegie Library on High Street. Christmas was simpler in Evelyn's day, much more wholesome. Sending and receiving cards took precedence. I arranged Christmas card for Hill's family and Jesse's. I won for mum. Evelyn mailed her cards three days early, so they'd arrive on Christmas Eve. Next of import came food. Evelyn, quote, hunted up Abnon Gardner, and he gave me some th thyme and sage, former for stuffing turkey. Their Christmas Eve meal consisted of hash mutton, vegetables, ver various, boiled potatoes, mince pies, sago pudding, and cocoa. On Christmas Day, Mrs. Cameron wore a smart black velvet gown, and Evelyn wore her renovated Gerald's evening dress. They, Ewan as well, enjoyed roasted, roast turkey, bread sauce, mashed potato, plum pudding, oranges, biscuits, grapes, and Carlsbad plums. I would spend the afternoon reading these diaries and go home and think, what am I going to cook? <laughs> <laughs> she was such a cook. Well, in Scotland, they passed time with walks to the sea or in the Dornick woods if it was windy. When it was stormy, as it often was at winter, they read books or magazines lent to them by their new neighbors and wrote. Ewan could easily spend half a day at his writing table, much as he had in Montana. Their season in Scotland brought Ewan significant literary success. The English journal Country Life published an article on the antelope and accepted another on the marsh hawk. The periodical Land and Water published both the mule deer in Montana, and the article on wolves. Quote, Ewan's wolf article began in Land and Water, received this evening, great rejoicing. Evelyn's photographs illustrated the mule deer article, but she didn't receive any photo credit. Despite keeping busy, Evelyn sorely missed her active Montana life. She was discontent to be cooked for and to have no place of her own to shape. On the eve of the New Year, she, New Year, she lamented, this life is so depressingly tame. I long so to be doing something. A lament that some women still express, their lives restricted by lack of education or the society they, were, they are born into. To stave off some of her restlessness, Evelyn sketched, painted, and baked bread. And come spring, she began photographing again with renewed passion. The pretty maids, Teeny's house and family, Mrs. Ingalls' house, Mrs. Cameron and Benny, the postman, Tignamara, Dornick, the Sutherlands, the Pine Woods. Evelyn photographed all and sent prints off as gifts. As she had in Montana, Evelyn made friends among the locals. She was not only conscientious of how her upbringing set her apart, she had the social grace to bridge that distance. I got two tickets to the concert, 
We are so hard up just now and only go so as not to appear to hold aloof from the residence, especially as Mrs. Hagen is managing it. It's for a new ladies' golf club and golf ground, the proceeds. Evelyn remained cognizant of the gentry in their mix as well, reserving special interest in the Carnegies. Carnegie, a Scotsman who made a fortune in the United States through oil investment, and by revolutionizing steel production, helped fund the building of free libraries in the United States and later in Scotland. Early in his life, Con Carnegie was considered a friend to workers. By 1900, however, however, Evelyn noted this turnabout. Carnegie builds his own house and free libraries, but won't improve crofters' houses. By crofters, Evelyn meant the poor farmers who rented Carnegie's land Late in May, she reported seeing the Carnegies at the cathedral. Quantity of servants of Carnegies in church, and Mr. and Mrs. and sweet-faced gray-haired lady came in, sat at last row of chairs in their pews, numerous well-bound bond books in it. I had no idea of the history of people claiming pews at church until I did this research. They, they owned pews in Evelyn's day. One beautiful day, she and Ewan hiked the four and a half miles at, to Skibbo Castle, the ruins that Andrew Carnegie was restoring for his home. She asked for permission to take photos with the intent of amusing Hilda, her sister. She reported on the makeover to her sister. Very little of the original castle will be left when the new one is finished. A force of 250 men was employed and a piper on the roof playing to them whilst I was there. After more observation, she declared Mr. and Mrs. Carnegie a devoted couple. It is hard to remember that Evelyn was only 32 while they lived in Scotland. Ewan was in his mid-40s, in precarious health, and quite dependent on Evelyn. He hated to walk alone when she was busy developing and printing photographs. Ewan loathed to go out alone. Yet when they went out together, he wasn't always dependable. I made him mad and he left me. I laid down on the sea and watched waves. Just four days earlier, she had written, we made up our two-month coolness. Not, I don't know what that meant. So I'm going to skip a couple pa um, paragraphs. You, Alec had the brother who had lived with them had um, sued them when he got back to Scotland. He was a rascal to the end. Um, just a few more minutes. And then, so she's dealing with that. After signing over her mortgage to Alec, she and Ewan went over to play a game of cricket, which they did nearly every day on the golf course. Ewan and she had a lot of fun on this golf course. Mostly Ewan won, but occasionally Evelyn did. Their team names demonstrated their playfulness. England versus Scotland, or photographers versus literary beggars. Ewan and I had some good games of cricket. Crackle toast versus egg eaters. Egg eaters won. They also raced each other, sometimes marking the course beforehand. Had a 78-yard race, dead heat. Despite Ewan's displays of immaturity, Evelyn was devoted to him. She attended to him most mornings, shopped and ran errands for him, organized the groceries and cooking based on his needs, read his manuscripts, illustrated his ar articles, packed his clothes, and arranged his things. He matched her intellectual curiosity. Everywhere they go, they noted the seabirds, and in the end, he was willing to return to Montana earlier than they had planned. On June 10th, they said their goodbyes and traveled as far as Edinburgh and with Mrs. Cameron, with Mrs. Cameron, where they separated. Mrs. Cameron and Ewan had argued at least weekly all the winter long. Row, Mrs. Cameron and Ewan, Ewan unstrung with these perpetual rows. Mrs. Cameron always airing grievances, although small, sometimes they irritate. Despite the tension, Mrs. Cameron was sorry to lose their company, 
saw Mrs. Cameron off. She was very unhappy losing Ewan. Evelyn and Ewan spent a month in Goulain, a town on the south shore of the Firth of Forth. While there, Evelyn's mother attempted to dissuade her from returning to Montana. Hopes I will not work so hard in America. Thinks it wrong for me to do so. If I had 200 pounds, says I ought to live in this country easily on it. When Ewan went to visit his brother one last time, Evelyn sallied forth, unfettered. She visited the Earl of Weissmus Castle, neighboring villages, and the seashore, one day covering 20 miles in boots too tight. Ewan never could have kept up with her. Before leaving Dor Dornick, Evelyn had heard from a neighbor that the Dornick people called her the walking lady. She even brought herself, bought herself a small bunch of vetches and roses, an extravagance for her. The evening before Ewan was due back, she found a rocky promontory on the east side of the harbor and watched bathers, very amusing. Everyone into dinner, I ate mine, sardine sandwich in the rocks, and four oranges. Then she wrote in German, Ich bin ganz glücklich. Glian, I am completely happy. Evelyn was going home. So thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Thanks for your attention. Yes. 